Hello, my name is Doug Dorch, minister at Captiva Chapel by the Sea. Thanks for joining me today as we consider a brief message on how faith sustains us in the face of senseless suffering, a message that I hope will bring you some encouragement for your day. In the aftermath of Hurricane Helene, I know there are many of you who are wondering how God could allow such bad things to happen to otherwise good people? It's a good question. As someone has said, what a religion has to say about suffering reveals more than anything else what it believes the nature and the purpose of our existence to be. That statement always crosses my mind whenever I read the Lamentations of the 22nd Psalm. For Psalm 22 is a psalm that deals head-on with the challenge of human suffering. I read the psalm and I find it ironic that it would come before what is arguably the most popular and the most well-known of the psalms, Psalm 23. For the spirit of those two psalms, Psalm 22 and Psalm 23, is as different as night and day. Psalm 22 is a lamentation. Psalm 23 is a psalm of refuge and strength. So how is it that in the providence of God these two psalms have been joined together? Well, it may be that God is telling us that the lamentations of our suffering are as much a part of who we are as our praise and that our praise only retains its authenticity, its genuineness, when it is in some way joined with honest lamentation? So let's be honest today. Well, this psalm is a problem for many believers, at least this part of the psalm where the psalmist wonders why God has forsaken him, it's a problem because of the way the speaker of the psalm takes God to task. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me? There is this shake your fist at God quality to the 22nd Psalm, a way of relating to God which makes many of us uncomfortable because that's not how we were taught as children to speak of God, to think of God. But as we grow up and we encounter the senselessness of life, are there not times when the pressures that life sends our way cause us to have questions, questions that bubble up from our souls regardless of our best efforts to contain them? I think there are. And I think the task of faith is to give us a way to handle those questions, those concerns, and more importantly, the emotions that are behind them so that we might follow them up with confessions of trust and devotion. So perhaps the place to begin is to acknowledge the brutality of life, which is not what God intended for life to be. But it's precisely what, for so many, life has become. The challenge that so many are facing today is the reality that in the face of a culture that keeps telling us that our pain is in some way something that we must have brought upon ourselves, we know in our heart of hearts that's not true. If you're hurting, it's not because you're somehow responsible. If you're in pain, it's not always because you've done something to deserve it. Now, I believe in the law of reciprocity. I wouldn't argue for a minute that for many people it is very true that they sow what they reap. But I also understand that for other people, their suffering didn't come about from anything that they did. There's no correlation whatsoever between their actions and their anguish. And so as people of faith, we need a way of voicing this absurdity in our discipleship. We need a way of grappling with this hard truth 
before the God who at times, quite frankly, seems nowhere to be found. If I have any criticism of the way that so many people believe, it's the criticism that so much of how we believe is all triumph. It's all conquest and victory. There are no losses along the way. But what does that say to those good and faithful people who aren't experiencing very much victory? What does it say to hurting people who are being pummeled and pounded on an everyday basis as a result of things that they did not cause or create? So does so much of our discipleship not call such faith a fraud? That's why what a religion has to say about suffering reveals more than anything else what it believes the nature and the purpose of existence to be. So what does our religion say? It says this, that in the cross of Jesus Christ, God knows your pain and your suffering. It says that in Jesus, God meets you in the very anguish of your life and stands with you in your pain and your sorrow. It says that the sufferings of our Savior show us that our God is a suffering God who is able to create new life and new possibilities in the face, in the very face of absurdity and even death. People who are in pain find great comfort in the knowledge that Jesus himself uttered the very words of this 22nd Psalm while nailed to the cross. For as both Matthew and Mark tell us, Jesus claimed this 22nd Psalm as a way of experiencing first his alienation, his estrangement, and his disappointment, so that when Jesus voiced it all and gave form to his sense of God forsakenness, he was offering up, not just for himself, but for us, a means by which we might give voice and form to our suffering, to our agony, so that the wounds of life might be robbed of their authority. I'll never forget that Palm Sunday on March the 27th, 1994. I was pastor of a church in North Alabama, and on that particular Sunday, all of the North Alabama region was under a tornado warning. Palm Sunday, our church was made up of primarily young families, and because we didn't have a church basement, we had to come up with an emergency plan on the spot. What were we going to do if a tornado touched down? Fortunately, a tornado didn't touch down that day, but unfortunately, one did touch down just up the road from us in a little Methodist church where children were performing a Palm Sunday musical. When a cloud came down and the little church was demolished and there were 90 people who were injured and 20 who lost their lives, one of whom was the four-year-old daughter of the church's pastor. I remember reading accounts of that tragedy the next day in the newspaper, normally Reporters are callous to all heartbreak, but whoever the reporter was, I can't remember. He was understandably touched at a deep level. I remember the reporter asking the pastor, how can you have faith after all of this devastation? To which the pastor replied, you don't need faith for things that you understand. You only need faith for the things that you don't. You see, what a religion has to say about suffering reveals more than anything else what it believes the nature and purpose of existence to be. And the challenge of our faith is to speak clearly about how we cope with what at times is simply the senselessness of life. Now, we can't pretend that senselessness doesn't exist or that the pain 
and the suffering that it creates really don't matter. Instead, we must cope by confessing how in the first place we can't understand it, we can't make sense of it, we can't completely unpack all of the senselessness. But what we can do is in the face of that absurdity, we can hope that God does know, that God does understand, and that God is at work. We can say that because of the crucified Christ and the knowledge that somehow God was working at Calvary in the face of that absurdity, not so much to give an answer to it, as to give us all a reservoir of hope and grace that will always sustain us in the face of whatever absurdity comes our way. Thank you so much for listening today. Now, make it your commitment to hold fast to your faith in the face of life's senselessness. And I'll look forward to seeing you next week.